But here's what they should fear. Um, after we invaded Iraq, Iraq and Syria became the uh, the beating heart of global jihad. They should be terrified of this possibility. If we get to a situation of mass civilian slaughter and all that, it could become a magnet for everyone across the entire Middle East and all the other, you know, the young guys who fought in ISIS, they, they're going to start coming. Now what? Now, you know, it's a perpetuation. It's a cycle. Now we're starting to get attacked, you know, here because then it becomes an America ally issue. I realize this is unpopular, but, you know, you got to think about this. We all lived through Iraq and have 20 years of Afghanistan. We literally saw all of this all happen. So. My great priority is to keep America out of a war. Um, and unfortunately, though, I think we're far closer. Remember this. We're only not at war with Russia today because they have nuclear weapons. If if this was pre-nukes, we 100% be in a war with Russia. And Iran does not have, at least for now, does not have nuclear weapons. That that deterrence is not there. And that, that scares the hell out of me. Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and this week it's just me. Uh, we had on for the third time, which I believe is a record, uh, Sagar and Jetty, one of the founding board members of American Moment, for yet another fantastic episode of this podcast. But before I get to that, be sure, as always, to go to AmericanMoment.org. There you can find everything that we're doing at American Moment. We are an organization with a what and a why. The why is the agenda that we talk about on this show every single week, an agenda that puts America first, whether it's um, those policies on economics to ensure that the working class have dignity in this country, whether it's immigration, making sure that we have a secure border and a real nation whether it's culture, technology, foreign policy, which we talk a lot about in this episode, making sure that the neocons are consigned to the dustbin of history as they belong. Um, that's our why, but our what is everything we do at American Moment, which is helping develop personnel who will implement those priorities in D.C. So if you're someone who's been watching a ton of YouTube videos on this issue, um, but really want to get involved yourself, reach out to us. Go to AmericanMoment.org slash join. Fill it out. We'll meet with you. We'll find a way to get you plugged in right here in Washington. This week, I had on a, an old friend, potentially, um, I would say my oldest friend in Washington, Sagar Njeti. Uh, he is the founder and host of Breaking Points as well as the Realignment podcast. He was a founding board member at American Moment. Um, he is wildly famous. Um, he has built two uh, multi-million follower YouTube channels in a row. He is the king of new media as far as I'm concerned. And we had this fantastic discussion about a whole bunch of topics. We talked about um, what it's been like to be an independent media, uh, his reflections on the war in Ukraine and how all the neocons have gotten that wrong and the pressure in the media. And newly breaking what's going on in Israel-Palestine. Um, look, I don't agree with everything Sagar says on it, but his perspective is clearly measured and honest, and he walks through how this could easily backfire and end up hurting America immensely if we don't get the approach to it right and not just jingoistically wander ourselves into another war. Israel has a right to defend themselves. Hamas isn't truly evil, genocidal organization that should be wiped off the face of the earth, but we cannot enter World War III. It was a fantastic episode. Hopefully you guys listen all the way to the end because at the end we talk about um, one of Sagar and I's shared pet peeves, which is the degenerate slob that is John Fetterman and everyone else who dresses like a schlubby moron in dc there's lots of money here that's not the issue it's that people don't care and they think they're better than you when they dress like crap so we talk a little bit about the menswear stuff at the end as well it's a fantastic episode we'll go now to sagar and jetty Sagar, thanks for coming back on the podcast. Hey, thanks, man. Appreciate it. You're a, a third time returning guest. I don't Ooh. think anyone's been on that often. So it's a great so honor. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And we seem to always have you on when there's like wars and stuff starting. So. Yeah, I know. It's bad luck. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's good. You know, yeah. I guess and we had this content. booked ahead of time this time. It yeah, you're not, right. Yeah. You're right. That's true. So um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, everything that's going on in the news. But I want to start with your, I guess, a year and change into starting your new show, uh, your new channel, Breaking Points, going full independent media. Is it everything that it's cracked up to be? Have the Ooh. terrifying sleepless nights ended yet? What's the experience been like? It's actually two years and change. Yeah. Uh, I know which time flies, which is crazy. Yeah. I mean, look, there's pitfalls. It's actually nice. Here's something I'll tell you. Any aspiring entrepreneur out there, being a W-2 employee, 
It's nice. Yeah. Let me tell you that. Don't don't get me wrong. That said, uh, it's even nicer whenever your business works out. Uh, look, there's pitfalls to running your own company. You know, you spend half your time worrying about accounting and taxes and all these other things of which you don't want to be doing. You just want to be focused on the content. That's what great media companies mm-hmm. can do for their talent. But I, I definitely wouldn't have it any, any other way. Well, we were very happy. You know, we hit a million. Mm-hmm. I actually don't really care. Post one million, I was like, all right, we're good. You know, yeah. it's one of those where I'm, I'm happy with the results. Uh, the numbers keep going up. So, you know, I'm happy. Yeah. What, um, you know, you guys have implied, you know, very legally carefully that there were certain restrictions on what you were able to say Mm -hmm. under the old regime that you guys operated under. I'm not going to ask you anything about that, but I am going to say, like, when it comes to the stories that have been the most edifying, the most freeing to be able to honestly and appropriately cover, like, is there anything that stands out in the last two years, like the things that have happened in the world that you are so glad you were independent oh, yeah. when it came time to talk uh, about it. Basically, every major foreign policy story, Afghanistan, Ukraine, and Israel, like currently. I think we have a very nuanced take on Israel, of which I'm very proud of for the show. Um, however, there's no way it would fly at the hill. I'm not stupid. You know, I know how what the internal boycott and freak out over that would be. And I saw some of it um, while I was there. Ukraine, there's absolutely no way that any questioning of the Ukraine consensus mm-hmm. from day one would have been uh, the same if we were still over there especially you know it's funny because i'll watch i know that some people have replaced us now and they actually it seems like they're uh, able to say mostly what they want i know there have been some instances but the thing is is that you know we had to fight so hard against that and i really think it took us like leaving and creating like an existential threat for them that to them to be able to be permissible also ownership change so there's like some different things and this is in no way to like call them out more mm-hmm. just to say like in the time that when i was dealing mm-hmm. with it and the paradigm the rules and all of that were set uh it would have been very very difficult to say what i actually think about any of these things. Um, And so that's the other thing, you know, whenever your boss really is a very multifaceted, different audience pool, uh, you know, I get messages from people like, I'm never going to watch again. I'm like, okay, that's fine. You know, I I, see you. You know, no, nobody forces you mm-hmm. to watch it. And I know that, you know, the Internet is effectively like a gigantic uh, is, is a massive place. I, d- I doubt I'll ever, uh, you know, run out of people to be able to reach. So, and you know, I'm not saying I don't say that in a, in a I'm not trying to be derogatory towards that person. I wish them the best. I just think it's uh, it's nice to be in a, in a position where we don't really have to worry about that. Mm hmm. So let's talk a little bit about those foreign policy stories, because I think they are the lens through which. Uh, you can best understand modern media. Um, Since we last did an episode of the show, um, the Ukraine war and its attendant coverage has happened. And then and then obviously just in the last couple of weeks, we've had the Israel-Palestine conversation starting with Ukraine. Um, What are those pressures like? Like what exactly are the moments that have stood out to you over the last year and change of covering that conflict that made you realize all the pressure that media has on it in moments where everyone's beating the drum for war. Yeah, that that's the biggest issue. And that's why I'm so lucky is, you know, I'm I honestly have been saying exactly what I think from day one. I was against the Ukraine consensus from the day that it started. And I I just know that I would have been totally untenable if I was attached to a major media organization. And also, I was very open at that time. I said, look, here's the truth. Ninety percent of you are going to disagree with me now. Let's check in a year from now. And everything that we said, has pred- has predictably come true. It has become a never-ending war. Yes, everyone was like, oh, see, they got it wrong. It's like, yeah, they had one limited spring offensive. They have depleted U.S. and American stockpiles. They have heightened geopolitical tension. They have distracted our diplomatic efforts and really just the zeitgeist mm-hmm. from what is actually important both here at home and in terms of what we actually face abroad. And it's been a mass gaslighting mm-hmm. of the American public. Also from a domestic p- perspective, wh- who knows how many untold trillions Americans have had to pay for the failed sanctions regime against Russia and for Ukraine. We've all been paying a buck 50 or more per gas uh, per gallon. In the beginning, remember, polling was like, oh, I'll pay it. You know, yeah, six months later, two years later, how does it feel now? And oh, it turns out the situation, Russia has, still has 20% of all of Ukraine. So how much longer should we keep paying higher gas prices? How much longer should we penalize our own population, deplete our stockpiles, deplete you know our taxpayer dollars, all for this one purpose of which is ultimately making us less safe and creating a terrible situation on the ground? Speaking this way makes me no friends. I It's funny. I lived through Black Lives Matter, Stop the Steal, 
many co uh, controversial. Ukraine is the most, maybe up there with Israel-Palestine, although I think actually Ukraine is worse. Uh, in the beginning, during the hysteria, it was the worst, most like jingoistic environment, warmongering uh, thing that I had seen probably in my entire lifetime. It's gala season, folks, and we at American Moment would like to personally invite you to the American conservative annual gala that is happening here on October 26th. By the time this episode comes out, uh, that means you will have very little time to register. Um, so I'm going to ask Jared here to, to flash the URL on the screen, put it in the description. Um, you're definitely not going to want to miss out on being at this event. We do a lot of events at American Moment. We attend a lot of events, um, but the TAC Gala is always an extreme highlight of the year. Uh, this year, they'll be having uh, Dr. Kevin Roberts, who is the president of the Heritage Foundation, as a keynote speaker, and they will also be giving awards to Michael Knowles and Ambassador Jack Matlock. Um, you're not going to want to miss it. They're going to be doing it at the Ritzy Ritz-Carlton in Pentagon City. Um, this is always a, a fantastic event. I learn a lot. All of your friends and fellow Moment of Truth listeners will be there. So we highly encourage you to register. We'll be there. Come up and talk to us. Tell us about your favorite episode of Moment of Truth. We look forward to seeing you there. Uh, you can check out more information about the gala on the American Conservative website. So one of the things about it that was interesting is that I'm sure that over the last 15, 20 years, as you came up in politics, you expected to be the anti-war voice on the right against the left that was much more anti-war. That is not the dynamic no, that's happened with yeah. the Ukraine war. What is being in that kind of environment been like where, you know, obviously Crystal on, on the kind of left right mm -hmm. um, consensus of y'all's show is is much more honest about the issues going on in Ukraine, but the Institutional Democratic Party in DC and a lot of left of center media have been unanimous yeah. in their endorsement of the war. What What's it been like just posturally for you having you know, your old friends on the right more with you than, you know, the people well, on the left. I, I wouldn't say that, though, yeah. actually. Uh, in the beginning, there were quite a lot of, uh, oh, you know, I understand. But it actually, I, I would uh, push back a little bit. I actually think I was truly blackpilled during Afghanistan, which yeah. people can go watch. Oh, yeah. We, we did an episode about it. He was uh, where, yelling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because at that moment, everyone was just lying mm -hmm. about why we should stay in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. which I was told was one of the core things that Trump ran on. And it was actually one of the major failures of the Trump administration. Everyone basically just bifurcated amongst like cultural war lines and basically lied to Americans about the withdrawal from Afghanistan, which two years later, all the claims are let's 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 just take a moment because I enjoy doing yeah. this. How many American citizens were uh, taken hostage and killed by the Taliban? Zero. Uh, had there been mass killings of uh, American translators and all these other people who were uh, left behind in the Taliban regime? No. Um, has there been any major terrorist attack that has been mounted from Afghanistan? No. Uh, have we been able to take out high level Al Qaeda leadership, even though we have no ISR remaining in the country? Yes. So what was the purpose of the whole thing? Oh, you just wanted to stay so girls could yeah. go to school. Yeah. OK, then say it. Yeah. Say it, though. Uh, and, you know, they'll, they'll never admit any of those uh, that they got blatantly and totally wrong. Let's not to mention, let's say, you know, how can you save your beloved Ukraine if we have got, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars that we continue to pour into Afghanistan? They don't. These people don't live in the real world. Mm -hmm. You and I are living it. Right now, Lindsey Graham and Nikki Haley are warmongering on Iran. It's like, how many wars do you people want us to fight? You want us to fight in Russia? You want to fight in uh, Iran? It's like, at what point do we have to make like real world choices and actual trade offs? So, look, it's uh, with the institutional left and, and frankly on the right. I just realized I'm like, oh, actually, nothing changed. Um, Afghanistan was the real like mask off moment for me because I saw. All of the neocons rocket right back to power on the right, and they were just using like fake MAGA talking points to get their uh, status. Yeah, you just yell peace through strength. Exactly, peace through strength, <laughs> and all this other nonsense. And that was that. That was it. And remember, they they were in charge on Ukraine for a long time. We have not won the Ukraine fight at all. I want to be very clear. There, how many senators agree with us? Maybe five, five ish. Yeah, about a dozen. All right, well, yeah. maybe. And on a good day, we'll vote yeah. that way. Yeah. Not, even, but remember. Some of them won't vote that way for the right reason yeah. because they disagree on the strategy. It's for like fiscal reasons, which I mean, I'll take it yeah. you know, on the vote. But in terms of like what they actually think, they still mostly agree with the unit party. So, all right, that's the very tiny majority of the party, maybe half the House of Representatives. I will say I great credit to Matt Gates, uh, Warrior Gates and uh, Marjorie <laughs> Taylor Greene. They got it done. Yeah. Uh, Matt, 
removed Kevin McCarthy, which there's a lot of things to say about that, but I do think that it set the stage such that $100 billion is not going towards Ukraine. But it's still, I mean, we it's might never get years. another Ukraine aid bill. That could it's happen. Put, I, I wouldn't put it past them. Yeah. I remember this. This is their number one agenda. This is their number one concern. Except maybe number two now because of Israel. Um, but that's a whole other conversation. So the point, though, is that it really revealed to me like the fetish that they actually have for like the Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic Alliance. And, and really fundamentally is their view is just so misguided. It's wrong. It is emotional. None of it has to do with actually American. And they all invent all these fake rhetorical schemes, which just don't pass muster at all. They're like, the way to stand up to China is to beat Yeah, uh, this beat has become Russia. the new shibboleth. Is like everything that we always right. wanted, but now the gloss is China as yeah, opposed it's to like, everything else. Wait, <laughs> hold on a second. What? So uh, we are depleting all of our military stockpiles engaged in an endless war and supporting in a great power conflict in an area of the world which is GDP share is rapidly diminishing. Meanwhile, our actual allies who are useful and actually pay their bills and produce useful things are under threat in the East. And no, no, no. So by pouring all of our attention and stockpiles over here, that's how we support it them over there. It doesn't even, you know, it doesn't even pass the smell test at a very basic level, but you just invent these things like out of whole cloth. Or then the other one is like, we're depleting our greatest enemy's military for only 5% of our military budget. I'm like, yeah, well, we're also getting ourselves closer to a nuclear exchange for yeah. only 5%. Or no, that, that, so it's either a good deal or it's actually a terrible deal. You yeah, know, that 12 hours it, where right? a missile fell into Poland. Oh my God. And like yeah. people were like, all right, boys, it's time yeah. for Article 5. Yeah. It's like every day that this conflict continues continues as an opportunity for a black swan event Correct. that could cause untold damage yeah to the world. and by the way don't forget what happened the, uh, Zelensky lied he's never been held to account for that he immediately blamed Poland. he's never apologized to the polish people something that they only recently woke up to and yeah i mean everyone in the biden administration everyone we all just decide to move on including many in the uniparty of people on the right so uh i do not think that this war is uh, that this uh this war within the right has been won at all i think that at the t for a moment there's a temporary win behind um, the people who agree with us on their backs, but but I would not put it past them. I mean, this Israel situation, they could easily get it done, tying all three. I just saw that's the administration's plan. They want to tie border security, Israel, Taiwan, and Ukraine all together <laughs> and pass it, which is, you know, I mean, you, know, you got to give it to them. They do at least rhetorically know what they're doing. Luckily, so far, even people like Marco Rubio have said that's not going to happen. Jim Jordan said, that's not going to, I don't know, you and I are speaking in a very tumultuous moment. I don't know who the hell is going to be the speaker. That said, I do not expect a $100 billion package to pass. Yeah. Maybe $6 billion, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know what that will look like. But that's still, you know, that we, we'll take it. You know, I think some of the tendency, especially when you're opposing the party that, you know, basically represents your side of the aisle, that is to say mm -hmm. the Republican Party, is to assume that the grass is always greener on the other side. Has your opinion of the left and the Democratic Party changed based on their response to Ukraine. Uh, well, on Ukraine, interesting. I guess I never expected anything more from them. I honestly didn't. Uh, I do think that Russiagate poisoned so much of the vo voters' minds and really all the way that they think about these issues. So I don't know. I guess I still think equally as bad as I always did um, in terms of how they look at. I mean, th these are the people who are more shameless than anyone. They rightly oppose and, and correctly oppose the war in Iraq and then immediately drafted Bill Kristol, Nicole Wallace and any other person who would say bad things about Trump in order to forget, you know, who some of the chief criminals of our era are. And I'm talking really in terms of like why we are in the position that we are today. They've been totally rehabilitated and then not only rehabilitated, but then propped up for events such as Ukraine, I mean, there would be no, I mean, just consider how Obama handled Ukraine and the domestic political environment compared to Biden. It's night and day, a complete difference. And it's funny, you know, reading Obama's interview with Jeffrey Goldberg, I'm like, I agree with half of what this man says. I'm like, where did this part of the Democratic Party go? But it's gone. It's dead. And Russiagate is the one killed it. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I think that the real story is how different the left wing of the left wing is from the right wing of the right wing. Mm. You have not seen any opposition, even at the order of a handful of members. Yeah, you know, even right. the great champion, Ro Barbara Khanna. Lee, yeah. Ro Khanna. Had him on my show. I asked him. He said he would vote for it. 
I was shocked. I mean, honestly, the, the, these these members that were supposed to be the great vanguard of left wing change have shown themselves right. to be pretty easily institutionally captured. Say what you want about the Republican conference. At least there's 20 people that are willing to stand up and say that maybe we should have a different path. Mm-hmm. Um, although I think that Democrats tend to have more faith in their party leadership than Republicans do in yeah. general, both at the I, electorate level. I wonder level. what would happen if Trump was in charge. Yeah. I don't know. See, that's where I'm like, I have a lot of questions. I'm like, I wonder if, let's say Trump, though, did his thing where he like jujitsu himself into actually sending more weapons to Ukraine than Biden would have done. Would there still be the same level of consternation from MTG and Gates? Personally, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, there probably would be some mm-hmm. um, who would disagree with Look, the Matt Gates was the person yeah. who was trying to get um, uh, the uh, Saudi conflict in Yemen uh, shut down with, right. during the Trump administration. That's true. Trump vetoed that bill. So Matt has always, and I'll give him uh, extraordinary credit for this, he has always been a very consistent voice. Mm-hmm. I do wonder about some of the more partisan actors whenever it comes to Ukraine. But I will take their vote and I will take their support anytime yeah. I can get it. That said, I'm not sure how ideologically mm-hmm. consistent but it's politics you t- you know you go to war with the troops that you have yeah so israel um we are taping this just a couple of days after the conflict has started from the moment that it was clear that something was going down i, I honestly would love to hear a play-by-play mm. of what these last few days have been from someone from your vantage point both in terms of how as um a media figure yourself you've tried to separate truth from fiction and then the media pressure for a certain narrative and and where you actually stand on on what's going on sadly i've had a decent amount of practice um at this point i started my career in washington covering the civil syrian civil war and have basically covered every single uh, have been at the center of news and specifically like near the top of american politics or commenting around it in terms of washington ever since and that's just not even that's not even that long that's only like 10 years so and then obviously my entire real like political orientation kind of stems from the iraq war it went in interesting directions but we are where we are uh the point is that with israel immediately i understood that it was just like ukraine i'm like this is going to be highly emotional there's going to be a ton of misinformation we have to do an incredible job about sifting through what is true and what is not we will not let emotion cloud our actual news judgment it's different from saying that you won't let your emotion get into your analysis but whenever it comes to like what we are going to present as fact and not you cannot let that bleed in. Unfortunately, a lot of people have been doing it i've seen viral claims that eventually end up being misproven or misconstrued or stated a different case and everyone is just willing to believe basically anything that they read it's very very important not to do that um whenever we have fast moving things because these things are your emotions are being played with for a reason and by both sides to be honest you know by the palestinians and by the israelis so that you know for me it's much more of just like a i'm in a state of caution i'm just in a state of it's almost like uh, it's like a battle because you're like constantly being bombarded. Uh, you have people who are pulling you in all directions. They want you to represent this side. The pro-Israel side is like, oh, you got to represent the Israel side. The Palestinian side is like, no, you got to represent the Palestinian side. And then people are like, hey, you got to say this. and You got to say that. And you're like, well, oh, my gosh, like, I just feel like I'm getting totally bombarded. Luckily, I'm just, you know, I'm, in where, I'm at where I'm at because I'm an extraordinary skeptic uh, and pretty much remain that way. Anytime I see America being pushed towards some sort of military conflict, you got to start asking questions. So that's where and kind of how it's been from the very beginning of just like, oh, God. And also, I really consider myself as someone who's like, I don't like to go in front of the microphone or in front of my camera with without doing hours and hours and hours of research myself, running through with my team, uh, talking with everybody about it, even beforehand, formulating my thoughts best so that I'm not just coming blind. I want to be able to come in there very prepared. A lot of people are very busy and they take time. They give me the great privilege of their time and their attention to try and figure out what's going on. So you really owe it to those people in a moment like that. So that's like on a personal level. Uh, in terms of like where we're at right now, obviously it's hard, it's horrible what's happened. You know, the attack on Israel. Now we're in a situation where, look, I mean, I don't, I think my orientation is not uh, a secret here. I'm, you know, pretty, I've come to the position and I will give credit to the Trump wing for kind of opening my eyes to this type of ideology to really the school of like realism, neorealism, accepting um, an orientation where I have have a policy where I try to stop the emotions at the door and just think about what's in it for us and what are we doing? Here is my fear right now. We are taping this. uh, It's Thursday. It is October 12th. So we don't know yet what has happened. My fear based on the current situation 
is that Israel has already committed to a full-scale attack against Gaza. We don't know what that's going to look like. It could be occupation. It could be a counterinsurgency campaign. It could be um, a shoot up campaign. We'll see. We, we don't know what that is. But my fear on this is that the overwhelming bipartisan consensus and others has tricked us into forgetting that there could be a tremendous political response from the Middle East should we see a full-scale humanitarian disaster in Gaza. And this is not a value judgment. This is what people need to understand. I'm not talking about whether you think it's justified or not. I'm talking about reality. The reality is, is a Gaza has 2.2 million people. It's one of the third most densely populated place on the earth. If we see mass death to the scale of 50 to 100,000 civilians die, I will just tell you this. The 2.2 billion Muslims who are on this planet will not take it lying down. To the scale of that, I don't know. The problem is, just as we just talked about black swan events in Ukraine, we could have similar black swan events in the Middle East. If you want to argue that that's worth it and that's fine, be my guest. But I I want to stay as far away, the hell away from that as possible. I could easily see a scenario where Hezbollah uh, disregards its Iranian masters and just declares war on Israel. Now what? Now what are we doing? Israel's now in a two front war. It's not just going to be about weapons. They're going to immediately, there's already calls right now to bomb Hezbollah, to bomb Iran from, from multiple U.S. lawmakers. Um, now what are we going to do? We're going to, we're, we will be in a situation where bombing Tehran is on the table. When bombing Tehran is on the table, we're talking about a full-scale Iraq-level uh, war in the Middle East. We have tens of thousands of service members in Bahrain who could get wiped out overnight. Iran and Hezbollah are far more formidable opponents, both to Israel and to the United States, um, than Hamas ever. Hamas has got these piddly little rockets and AK-4. There's nothing compared to what we would be facing. At the same time that we just depleted all of our ammo stocks and sent them over to Ukraine, we have a tremendous amount of domestic political strife. We could get dragged into this very, very quickly. That's where all my attention is right now. I, I want to stay out of this. Do you think that some of the American neocons are being more hawkish than even the Israelis are right now? Uh, no, to be honest. Israel is actually totally united in what they have to do um, in Gaza. And actually, I get it. You know, if I was Israel, I'd probably feel the same way. Uh, they, I mean, I just saw like Naftali Bennett, who's supposed, what is he, like center right or whatever. Like mm -hmm. he was just on TV today being like, I don't care about Palestinian civilians. So, I mean, I think that the mainstream view amongst this Israeli civilian population is basically what the mainstream view of the American civilian population was post 9-11. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's not a value judgment. They can do whatever they want to do. I actually respect uh, it, them in many ways in terms of how they prioritize their own national defense. They look at their own security and they look at uh, protecting their people above anything else. For example, not sending weapons to Ukraine when Zelensky has his hand yeah, up. Yeah, Max like, Boot was very angry about that. Right. A and they were of like, no, ago. we might need them. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> I wonder what he thinks about that now. Yeah. Except, you know, in his version, uh, I guess America can always just pay the bill. So anyway, that's yeah, a, a separate thing. More what I'm saying is we are in a situation where the vast majority of American lawmakers correctly are mm -hmm. outraged by, by what happened in Israel. The issue is is that the vast majority of these American lawmakers are not thinking about 40th order effects. Now, I already know that the pro-Israel people will be like, this guy's a squish, and he's like saying that we shouldn't be able to do what needs to be done. I didn't say that. What I think needs to happen is that I think the U.S. needs to tr tr exert a tremendous amount of pressure on the Egyptians and all the Gulf Arab states to foot the bill for a mass humanitarian evacuation of Gaza. We need to treat this just like we did the Battle of Fallujah. All the civilians have to go. Same with ISIS. This is what we did. Civilians, get out. All right. Now, listen, Hamas, they're the worst people on earth. They will trap some civilians with them. Um, but, you know, we need to give anybody who wants the opportunity or has the opportunity to leave Gaza. We need to get that done. We need to get them out of there. We could, you know, Egypt, whatever. Somebody can foot the bill. I think it should be Saudi Arabia and Qatar um, and not us. So. That needs to happen. Then, okay, go in. Do whatever you want to do. Just commit that when you're done, you pull out and the people from Gaza can come back. That's it. We can allay some tensions about, oh, you're going to reoccupy the land just like 67 and all this other stuff. We can make sure, you know, as long as you try to reduce meaningfully the amount of civil civilian casualties and you don't give the Iranians, the Syrians, the Hezbollah, all the greatest talking point and uh, victory they could ever have. We, we, we will be okay and the Israelis will be okay. But here's what they should fear. Um, after we invaded Iraq, Iraq and Syria became the, uh, the beating heart of global jihad. They should be terrified of this possibility. 
if we get to a situation of mass civilian slaughter and all that, it could become a magnet for everyone across the entire Middle East and all the other, you know, the young guys who fought in ISIS, they, they're just going to start coming. Now what? Now, you know, it's a perpetuation. It's a cycle. Now we're starting to get attacked, you know, here because then it becomes an America ally issue. I realize this is unpopular, but, you know, you got to think about this. We all lived through Iraq and have 20 years of Afghanistan. We literally saw all of this all happen. So. My great priority is to keep America out of a war. Um, and unfortunately, though, I think we're far closer. Remember this. We're only not at war with Russia today because they have nuclear weapons. If if this was pre-nukes, we 100% be in a war with Russia. And Iran does not have, at least for now, does not have nuclear weapons. That that deterrence is not there. And that, that scares the hell out of me. Yeah, it it's unfortunate because I... I actually do hear from people in D.C. who are actually quite hawkish who are saying, no, 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 we're not saying commit U.S. troops. But the mm -hmm. problem is that if we fall into a decision tree, that results in other Arab powers getting involved in yes. this war. The the logic will sort of militate that we do get involved. And so, well, they it's say not, the same thing on Ukraine. Yeah. No, no American troops on the ground. Yeah. yeah. For now. Yeah. Now what? Poland. Yeah. What now? And and, yeah. then, and then there's also, I mean, always the question of, yeah, we might not be technically in the war, but is mm. it seen by the opposing power as that? And do they yeah. act accordingly? Um, these are all open questions that hopefully we would have serious people in D.C. to answer them. But um, we haven't thus far. What have you made of um, ha have there been any bright points in the media coverage around? So obviously, Breaking Points has been trying to be as honest and uh, truthful as it has. But wh where have you been? seeing the great examples of people in media doing well during this conflict well i don't know and there's smatterings there's like individual people and individual outlets that you can follow uh i try and get a you know a diet of everyone my real recommendation would be don't trust outlets don't trust uh do individual look at their mm -hmm. track records over time look mm -hmm. at what they're saying do they issue corrections do they delete things mm -hmm. are they doing their best are they falling for emotional coverage go back and check what the hoaxes are did the people fall mm -hmm. for the hoaxes if they did did they come back and did mm -hmm. they correct the record if not well you know you should, that should be a telltale sign uh but i think that um yeah i'm, I'm not even going to point to individuals because you know everybody gets things right and wrong it's about how they approach whenever they get the uh whenever it comes to the moment of correction whenever it comes to the moment of continued coverage i just i would just urge everybody to be skeptical and to leave your you know you, you can be outraged and you can be heartbroken um but you also should just remember like what the inevitability of a lot of these conclusions and talking points are leading to you towards the palestinian cause has historically been a sort of backbone issue of like orthodox leftism in the yeah. united states yeah and, it's very interesting yeah yeah um and there's all sorts of reasons why that's yeah. the case i think um uh and we can get into that too but um you know, you have members of Congress that have historically affiliated with DSA leaving. You have all of these like spats breaking out of yeah, colleges Harvard. where people put out letters and people are quitting. What What are you making of how the left of center is reacting to this and how they're, you know, on on the front end of this, um, suddenly they're like luxury lifestyle beliefs about Palestine actually like the rubber had to meet the road when it came to what hamas mm. did and they're having to react in time to that yeah, it's fast it's, it's a real suicide mission i was talking about it just today with crystal and i just said look crystal i feel like i engage with a lot of lefties i feel like i know a lot of people even the bat you know the mainstream left take i would say which i think is embodied by a lot of crystal saying is that israeli and palestinian lives should be equally matter and that we should resist calls for wipe out of either and that we should do our best to respect the international laws of war and all that you can say that's stupid but like i think that's a legitimate point of view in american politics um what i was shocked by are these students for justice organizations who immediately are like they didn't even offer a single word of condolence or like outrage mm -hmm. at the attacks they're like no it's straight up israel i was i couldn't believe it yeah uh, this but is what was, decolonization looks yeah, like yeah I, 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 I was like whoa dude like and i'm like where does this come from where are they getting from. That's what that's really what I wanted to know, because I'm like, I feel like I have a pretty good view of like what most people listen to, especially in alternative spaces. And I can be like, oh, you know, that's coming from so and so or like all of it. But I, I was I genuinely was flabbergasted as to where it came from. I don't know. Um, well, I do think they're digging their own grave, um, considering who they're allied with. And, you know, the the funny thing is, is watching like Harvard and all these other organizations where if you as you can see, like Bill Ackman, um, who has called for basically like a 
can- a mass cancel of everybody who signed the letter and many other big donors to these universities. Like they are not going to, A, they're not going to stand for this. This is going to be a massive cleaning house moment. So ironically, they bra- they just stabbed in the front the people who were directly financing their entire bourgeois like way of life. And yeah, I think it genuinely will be amusing uh, to watch. I mean, it's just another like perfect example of the self-defeating, um, just like self-defeating narcissism and genuine just like bloodthirst and evilness of like some people who are d- in the deep, deep fissures of the elite like Amer, I wouldn't even call them left. Like I really don't know what it is because it is both elite, but also I don't know. I I, I really don't know what and how to properly characterize like this school of commentary. But they have absolutely shot themselves in the foot, and they will not be stronger as a result. There's going to be a mass purge, at least on the Israel side, um, for a lot of this. Anybody who touched any of that, and you are connected to elite organizations. Good luck to you because you're done. Yeah. I mean, do you think it's worse than it was when you were in college? I mean, do you think that this is just an extension of stuff that's been going on for a long time? Yeah, I think it's probably. I mean, look, I graduated from college 10 years ago, so I'm not the proper person to ask. I did. I'd never even heard the word transgender whenever <laughs> so, living in a different moment. I think that um, the elite left basically lost its mind during Trump, allowed all kinds of insane allies to you know they insane like temporary alliances Mm -hmm. with members who we're talking about here like truly like radical people were totally outside the pale they everything was papered over by Mm -hmm. the insanity of trump covid and black lives matter and that all of this though has been bubbling underneath the surface and has exploded up until now um so this is really if i had to say this is more of a reckoning with black lives matter than it is anything else yeah. Um, moving on to um, something else that's going on in the news. Uh, I'd be very curious um, for you to give a little bit of your perspective on how the 2024 race is shaped up. We'll mm-hmm. go Democrat and then uh, Republican. Starting with this, um, on the Democratic side, I keep on hearing this cope, especially on the right of center, that, oh, the left, they're not going to let Biden be the nominee. They're just preparing for someone else to be it. And I've been telling people for months now, I'm yeah. like, prepare to run against Biden. Biden is a formidable candidate. He's yes. probably the most formidable candidate no that the Democrats have. But what do you make of the dynamics inside the Democratic Party right now, how yeah. Biden's been able to basically prevent any mainstream challengers? Well, yeah, I mean, look, I'm not endorsing it because I don't think he should do that. Mm-hmm. But on, at a political level, he's obviously doing the correct thing. He's yeah. leveraging his his complete control of the institutional left, elite left, really what we're talking about here, and hit the DNC to rig the primary and process such that he faces no legitimate questions and at the same time has like this slavish like dog wagging media that is doing all of the work for his so why would that's what the obama Mm -hmm. people did in 2012 so why wouldn't you do the exact same thing to him to your point i agree with you let's actually the only person who is on the democratic side who i think would be a stronger contender than joe biden is gavin newsom I genuinely believe that Gavin is a strong candidate now at this point. His power levels have been going up significantly. What convinced me really were his sparring sessions with Sean Hannity because that takes actual confidence as a politician. He's greasy enough where he can get engaged into shouting matches. He clearly loves the game and he's enough of a narcissist to shapeshift himself in any possible way that he needs to to try and get elected. Plus, he's the governor of the most populous state in the country. So a populous state in the country. So that is uh, important. But- that's never going to happen in the age of supplanting a black woman. Mm-hmm. He himself has been like, I would never challenge Kamala Harris, you know, in that event. And it's because the institutional party would never allow that level of questioning over like the racial hierarchy. So if the only possible number two is Kamala, which it is in, in reality with the way that uh, the elite left politics work. Of course, Biden is the most formidable. And even the number two person to that is Pete Buttigieg, who has proven to be one of the most incompetent (laughs) members of the American. Seriously. And probably what? Like somebody uh, saw this. I forget who said it. Do you know how bad the secretary of transportation has to be for you to know their name? Correct. Yeah, it's like it's true. (laughs) Do you even know the secretary of transportation under Obama? I think it's the same one for all eight years. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Nobody knows. 
Um, the only reason I know under Trump is because it was Mitch McConnell's wife. Okay? Yeah. That's it. Uh, but it's one of those where there, we really should have no idea who that person is. He decided to take it with the explicit uh, promise of like turning it into a bigger position. It ended up being one of the first times in 50 years that the position mattered, and he's failed spectacularly. At well, it. and presumably yeah. he took it because he was like, this is a non-controversial exactly. docket. I'll right. get to say that I was a cabinet member, and I'll get to increase my connections and responsibilities. And yeah, we're going to spend a bunch of money, and I'm going to get to spend it for us. And it's like he found a way to screw up yeah. the easiest job. I mean, that's been one of my favorite yeah. plot lines in all yeah. of politics. I agree. Biden is a very formidable candidate. Biden speaks to the boomer mind in the, uh, like the most perfect way for a Democrat. You know, the come on, mm. man. Uh, remember, you know, the median voter in the United States is a 55 year old white guy with no college degree. Mm -hmm. Those people like Biden. Uh, they did a lot. You know, that's why they voted. A lot of them voted for him mm -hmm. in 2020. And so. I think he's a very formidable candidate. I do think, though, that obviously his age is the single biggest uh, problem with him. I think if he loses, mm -hmm. uh, this might be controversial. I think it will be more age than anything else. Mm -hmm. I, I really, I don't think it'll be economy. And I'll be, yeah, I think a lot of people are willing to forgive a lot on policy. If you look at a lot of the concern, he's just so old. It's undeniable that a lot of people are fed up with that. And uh, I mean, I agree with them. So it's one of those. But but here's the part of this that, yeah. that I think is is really interesting is that. You know, you, you guys talk a lot about on your show about these polls that show that people are not satisfied with mm. either candidate, including in each party. But I, my, my answer to that is always compared to what? Yes. You're right? right. And so it's like you could have other candidates get into the primary, but people could still prefer Biden to all of them. I think people just like their politicians less now than yeah. they used to, I think right. um, um, with the exception of Trump on the Republican side, which we'll get to in a moment. And so it's is this genuinely the preference suppose we even did have an open primary of the democratic electorate is I it think, joe biden oh absolutely i think biden would win a primary yeah. i just still think he should engage in a primary yeah. for like Demo small d democratic mm -hmm. purposes uh i still think he would win absolutely no question uh i maybe he would be actually i know i think he'd probably beat gavin newsom he's an incumbent you people don't throw incumbents out they like that type of politics it's possible though i don't know you know and that's the whole point of why he should subject himself to that process it would probably make him stronger because i do think he would win Anyway, um, put that to the side. I think you're right. Um, and I also, don't get me wrong, millions of people will still vote for him, even if they think he's so old, he's literally about to collapse and die because they don't mm. like Trump. I'm not saying he, I'm not saying he will win, but you know, don't just rely on any of these weaknesses to make sure that he's going to go down. Absolutely not. I think it's a total coin flip right now. I think direct 50-50 oh, at the ballot box. So let's talk about the Republican side. I believe the statistic exactly was that, you know, during the Trump administration, you were the reporter who interviewed him in person more times than anyone other than Sean Hannity. Was that the it exact? It was up there. Yeah, okay. It might have changed. Yeah. I'm not sure. uh, yeah. At some point, that was yeah. a statistic. You spent time. It was with high. Trump. I think it was in the top 10. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. spent a lot of time following, following him, a lot of the people around him. Um, there were a lot of people in D.C., especially, especially on the D.C. right, who thought that Trump was dead on arrival in the 2024 primary. You were not one of those yes. people. I always said he would um, win. Here's yeah. here's an opportunity yeah. for you to <laughs> gloat. I mean, again, look, not a single vote's been cast yet, but I, I do think that, um, you know, I, I, I'm i open to arguments on, on many sides that, you know, so-and-so might be a better nominee than Trump, but as an empirical reality of what was going to happen, I trust a lot of people who predicted things uh poorly a lot less than i used to because they just were wrong um and and it's 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 pretty clear that people still don't understand the singular role that trump has in the republican party um why don't you gloat for a little bit Tell I, us sure i mean <laughs> look it's 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 just basic it, for me it was just so obvious i was like this man speaks to the wants the needs the loves the priorities of the gop base more than anyone else and anyone who's like like DeSantis's entire case, and look, I got nothing against these people, all right? I all think they would be fine presidents. The thing is, is that somebody like DeSantis is like, I'm like Trump, but I'll actually get things done. I'm like, well, voters don't care about that. I'm like, voters think he's hilarious. Like yesterday, he was called Hezbollah smart. And people are like, oh my God, Trump is siding with Hezbollah. I'm like, is he? Or is he telling a freaking joke? You know, because I think that most voters can tell. And you being like an unserious person um, by trying to turn this into like a legitimate point of attack as if it's like Bush 2003. You're you're the idiot, not Trump. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's got the most popular. He's the most popular Republican amongst Republicans since Ronald Reagan. Uh, he's always been that way. He had a temporary dip 
in the two weeks after January 6th, after it became immediately clear that the entire January 6th thing would be used as a political cudgel against the Republicans and to this whole like new Patriot Act regime and all that, Republicans mostly forgave him and about 30% of the party, you know, who never particularly liked him remained skeptical and the rest have tremendous affection for him as a president and specifically like as the media figure that he is. I thought, I've always believed and I've basically said from day one, I said, I think DeSantis is DOA, dead on arrival. I think that uh, any of the candidates really um, who are challenging him are all doing it basically for their own purposes now at this point, which is fine, but I I respect that actually. Um, For them, many of them has worked out quite well. However, um, the idea that you're going to beat Trump is just ridiculous and outrageous to me Uh, and always has been. I think he's a singular force and he will remain so whether he is running or not until the day that he dies. That's just how it's going to be. Hilariously, it seems like we could enter a primary where the people who get second and third place are both other Indians, (laughs) Vivek and Nikki. Um, What do you make of of both of their candidacies? I think both of them have overperformed expectations in their own way. Um, Why have they done so? Yeah, the biggest loser to me in all this was DeSantis because he went from from a candidate position of almost like 37 to 40 down to like a normal number two. That's embarrassing to be, to be governor of one of the most popular states in the country. He's a real governor. He's actually quite good at being a governor. Best, best yeah. governor we've had in 50 years. He turned Florida into a actual red. St- that's crazy. And that's exactly why I said he shouldn't run. I was like, he's a young man. I was like, he should wait. And everyone was like, no, in America, you got to shoot your shot when it's time. And, you know, to borrow a phrase from Rick Wilson, everything that Trump touches dies. So uh, he's good at what he does. Don't take on people who are better than you. That's a very important lesson to learn in life. Then uh, Vivek. Vivek's genius is he's not actually running against Trump. Um, He's running to defend Trump. And it turns out that when you're doing that, you can't win. But a lot of Republicans will turn out to like you. So, yeah, I think it's a brilliant campaign uh, in order to not run against Trump. He's like, I believe Trump was the best president of my lifetime. But and it's like that's why he didn't get the. Consider this. This is a nobody. He gets more speaking time in the first presidential debate than any other candidate on the stage. He already won. He got the vice president to attack him. His name ID went sky high. But critically, he didn't get a single bump in the polls. Nikki, I mean, look, I... For some reason, boomers like a tough talking woman. You know, it's just like we had Carly she's Fiorina. Kicking. Yeah, she's always kicking. We don't know exactly in direction. They love the like, I'm, you know, kicking in high heels to forward and all this. It's not a viable political stick constituency. So it's like, why are we all pretending? We're talking about a 40 or 50 point deficit. And in the old times, we wouldn't even look at them. Like who? Do you remember who Paul Songus is? No, for a good reason. He actually did better than a lot of some of yeah. these people. It's like, this is all a joke. Yeah. So what do you think is going to happen in the general election? I think Trump is going to win. And then I think he will be an incredibly formidable candidate. I, I believe that Trump is the most formidable, a most electable Republican in the entire uh, field today. I've said I've always said that. I really his ideological malleability is exactly what gets him to the point where he can win. And everyone's like, oh, DeSantis and all that. I'm not convinced of that at all. Actually, I'm I'm not quite so sure DeSantis could uh, actually win the election in the way that or, or, or contest and activate the voters that they need. Now, listen, he's got a lot of downsides. He's got very high negatives. People get very pissed off about stop the steal and all that, which remains obviously a big problem for Trump. That said, you know, on abortion, which has been a massive political political killer for Republicans at the ballot box. Trump is the only one actively distancing himself and, to be honest, is the only one politically capable and has the talent in order to navigate the issue to activate both pro-life voters and in order to convince moderates that it's not something that he's going to make like a massive priority while he's in office and still be able to activate both of those constituencies at the same time of getting all of these like basically just candidates who hate political or voters who hate political correctness to come out and vote for him. The other great genius of Trump is he always sets the tone of the debate. He always sets the tone of his coverage. So look, I've got a lot of criticisms of Trump. Most of them have to do only with things that people in Washington would ever care about. But I am not naive enough post 2020 to say that voters care about any of that literally at all. And on a pure electoral level, yeah, I think he's absolutely no questions asked the most formidable Republican candidate so it's in very, the entire field. It's very popular to say that he's completely unelectable. Yeah. Um, on, I don't believe that at all. On, on the I right, mean, especially. Yeah. I mean, and, and Dems used to say it, too, for a while. Yeah. And then and then. 
you know, now they need to fundraise, so they need to yeah. <laughs> elevate the the threat. You know, it's like the, 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 there's two groups of people that love to show the polls where it's like, oh, Trump's polling at 54 percent. And it's yeah. like Dems raising money and like MAGA people who mm-hmm. are a little too credulous about the polls. Um, mm-hmm. But any, you know, quote unquote, smart person in D.C. pretends like it's it's beyond a shadow of a doubt that Biden will beat him. And I just, I've never understood where that comes from. It's like, one, it's we live in a profoundly divided country. Both of the last elections were won by less than, what, 80,000 votes yes, in three states. A- any any modern presidential nominee has a 40% chance of winning at Higher, least. I would say 45. Yeah. I, I really believe, I, and that's why I go total coin toss. I'm like, yeah, he's going to win the primary and who knows what's going to happen. You know, we're sitting here talking about Israel. Pal- Let's say we get into a crazy war with Iran, which is right on the brink. Trump, all you know, I think the funniest Trump talking point is, hey, we had peace for four years while he was in office. And whether he had anything to do with that or not, man, that is a great talking point when you're in the middle of Would, multiple Do, do international- you want mean tweets or yeah, world wars? <laughs> it's just like to say that in the middle of an international, multiple international crises, whether you think it's true or not, it doesn't matter. A lot of people will think that is true. Gas prices were lower when I was the president. A lot of Americans loved 2019 and they miss it a lot. Yeah. They want to go back to that. Guess who is the president? Trump. Mm-hmm. That is, he doesn't have to run on anything. He can just say, America, America, 2009. If I was him, that's all I would do. I would just say, make America 2019 again. Mm-hmm. Look at how much chaos is under Biden. Look how much less chaos there was under me. Uh, that's a very formidable political message. Also, who the hell knows what happens on that day? All, even also in the individual states, places like Arizona, which has borne the brunt of a lot of these um, border problems. Sure, you know, they've elected uh, Democrats in 2022, but who knows? Biden's only got a 31% approval rating in those places. Pennsylvania, I just saw a poll, we had Trump up by 12 points. Uh, Detroit, I, or Michigan, I think I saw one where it's not the best pollster, but still had him up by eight. I mean, these are polls that had Biden up by seven, you know, in 2020. And I think he won it by one or two points, something like that. So, yeah, I think Trump, look, Trump has always been both the best Republican and also his worst enemy. Um, and people are definitely willing to punish Republicans for Trump's transgressions. I have not yet seen evidence that they are willing to punish Trump for his transgressions. Uh, 2020 was close enough that it's pretty obvious that a lot of Americans really like this guy and absolutely will vote for him. So there's zero reason in my mind to think that any of that has changed. So you said that your disagreements with Trump mostly boil down to things that matter to people in Washington. Um, You used to be much more in kind of the business of like ideology, entrepreneurship and stuff. You've become much more of a media figure since. I'm curious, like what what should the agenda for a right wing president be in you the coming me. years? You're the one in this. I don't <laughs> yeah, know. look, it's, yeah, uh, yeah. But, but I'm curious, like, yeah. you know, you, with the vantage point that you have, like, okay. obviously, it's not the same thing that it would have been in 2016. We live in a different country today. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, so one of the things that's frustrating about being in these conversations is people keep on sounding the same way they've sounded for now, what, seven years? Yeah, like, right. it's, it's been a long time. The country yeah. changed a lot. A lot. Like, um, what should the agenda be? Uh, look, I believe what is what do great politicians do? They transcend their era and they create a new one. Lincoln, FDR, Teddy Roosevelt, they have an existing paradigm, they create a new paradigm. The best thing that Trump could do is to move himself from a candidate who just wins barely by 80,000 votes and loses the popular vote in 2016 to one who could, if he was able to be reelected four years after he won, win by five and, you know, reestablish a paradigm and complete the movement of a lot of different voters into the Republican category. Some of that will require policy. Some of that will require rhetoric, but mostly it just means not doing the same thing that you did in 2016 Mm -hmm. to 2020. I'm not naive enough to think that it's going to boil down to like one individual tax credit or others. It's a overall orientation of keeping the base solid Mm -hmm. and then also using strategic opportunities Mm -hmm. to expand out of there. Biden has been abject, abject failure at this because he tried kind of neoliberalism plus. And I think it's going to require 
something very different. It will require the mobilization of the overwhelming consensus against political correctness combined with a few strategic things on policy and then three and most important, keep America out of a war while you are in office. If you could do those three things, I absolutely think you could change the paradigm. So it's part of the yeah. reason that, that it's taken a while for that to happen or that it hasn't happened is because Biden's the last guy that just barely makes the Democratic Party not seem like a coalition of freak shows yeah. at the electoral yeah. level. Yeah. Like if if he wasn't like if it was Trump versus Kamala, mm -hmm. oh, does he win by five? I think he wins by ten. To yeah. be honest, yeah. I mean, I think I think it would clean up. Just out it would be outrageous the level of victory. You're right, you know Biden. But you know that's don't underestimate them. Don't underestimate them at the same time. People talk this way up before 2022. They won big. They won a lot of votes. And so you got to think and deconstruct why. And that's why you know, funnily enough. That's why I think Trump is the most electable. He's the most moderate. And yeah. it's it sounds crazy to a lot of people, but that's why he won. It was yeah. one third of the people who voted for yeah. Trump in 2016 and in 2022 were pro-choice. Show me another Republican who can get that done. I, I don't see one. One of the reasons yeah. I think Trump has always been extraordinarily successful is because he is exactly who he is. And yes. um, he's worn the exact same thing for the last 10 years. Um, in fact, as much be much longer than that. Um, he wears his Navy suit, oh, his red uniform. tie and yeah. his white shirt. Um, politicians um, uh, try to tell a story with the costume they dress up True. in. Uh, Mr. John Fetterman is trying to tell a very particular story about, with the costume he dresses up in. Um, how deep does your rage against John Fetterman go? Yeah, I really do hate John Fetterman. Uh, the thing is about John Fetterman is he is just the worst of the pl new play actors mm -hmm. in Washington. He's a rich kid who's trying to pretend that he's working mm -hmm. class. He is a guy who talks big, but behind the scenes is doing nothing. He's a complete emotional narcissist. And I think that's actually the best way to understand him. He puts his comfort before his constituents. He puts his comfort and his like, you know, faux patina over over respect for the overall institution. And what really pissed me off is, uh, you know, immediately after he got back from the hospital for his two month, you know, long stay about depression, he immediately attacked J.D. Vance, saying that he, J.D. cared more about like messaging instead of a railway safety bill. And I know that Fetterman was literally in the hospital whenever his staff signed on his behalf, co-signed the railway safety bill legislation and Vance and Sherrod Brown and all the offices were doing all of the legwork behind that. And that's when I was like, oh, this guy is a fake. He's fake. You know, he's just one of those people who he loves the camera. He loves the attention. He loves, you know, this fake, um, this like fake picture that he's tried to create around himself, a fool enough people into thinking it when it's really just all about him. And all politicians, by the way, who dress out of code, what they are doing is putting their comfort their individualism over service to their constituents like they don't do it to relate to you they do it because they think they're better than you and that's why when they changed the senate uh, dress code rules temporarily he was the only one allowed to dress that way and the staff and the pages and all those other people were still required to wear a suit a tie slacks and all those other things on the senate floor that was the perfect example because that's what i've always tried to emphasize when people in positions of immense power dress like slobs or dress out of uh, what is expected of them, they do it because they can. Think, okay, who are the first people to first buck the codes? It was the tech people. And the tech people did it in a way to say, screw you to Wall Street. It, it's an act of rebellion against the overall institution. In their case, whatever, okay, we're talking about business. Although I do think a lot of them should dress better. Uh, but in the case of politicians, he is saying, I am more, my comfort and my uh, chosen aesthetic is more important than the institution of the United States Senate and the history that precedes this chamber. And that is just the height of narcissism. It's not just him, just so we're clear. Uh, Kristen Cinema is also a major, but there's a lot of Republicans who walk around looking like schlubs too. A lot of these people do not take their position seriously. And that's, it really bothers me uh, when they do that. So the classic response that yeah. people have whenever, uh, people say that you should be dressing better or dressing mm. more formally to say, well, fashion changes all the time. You're not wearing tails wandering yeah. around Washington, D.C. Where right. is your, you know, trench coat or, you know, uh, your 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 fake wig or whatever? Mm. 
what's your response to that? I mean, are, are we just past the era of formality where the suit mattered? I mean, I like them. <laughs> I've been wearing well, them since okay. I was a kid. But the like, the history of the suit itself is an egalitarian garment. It was evolved in London and in British society as workwear that both the gentleman and the everyday mm-hmm. man could wear and is a sign of an egalitarian society. And that's why, you know, even with suits today, you know, we're fundamentally you and I are wearing the same garment, but there are a couple of things that, you know, can distinguish. And even what distinguishes a good suit from a bad suit is really only mostly available in terms of immediately like eye catching to let's say like one percent of the population Mm -hmm. so that's my whole point is that the garment was designed both egalitarian it's also designed to make you look better you look like shit when you're walking around in a hoodie guess what even when you're fat and gross and misshapen like john fetterman you look better (laughs) when you are in a suit you look more like the ogre that you are when you are not wearing a suit all politicians are like this if you've got a gut you should be wearing a suit and tie you know why because the entire point of the suit the garment and all of the rules around it are evolved to emulate one of the most fundamental rules of great fashion which is that it should draw attention to the face and it should prioritize your best features which are up here and not usually down here that's why only muscle men and all those look better in a t-shirt than they do in a suit the uh, odds are you are probably not that person and yet i still see republican politicians walking around in it's miller time t-shirts on <laughs> capitol hill and i'm like you're not cool dude you just look like a fat loser like what do you want and that's that's the other thing everyone's like oh Sagar is such an elitist i'm like i actually think it is deeply it is ridiculous to say that people who are elected representatives who are by definition the elite of the country should how is it elitist to say they should dress well? Mm-hmm. If you're walking around and you're having trouble mm-hmm. uh, making ends meet, God bless you. I got nothing but love for you. Wear whatever you want. I You got much bigger problems than what you're wearing and all that. I wish you nothing but the best. But these people are multimillionaires. They barely work. They come to Washington three days a week and they mostly don't do shit into like nothing. They can afford to abide by the traditions that just keep us Um, in a situation where we understand that they work for us. And the more that they become quote unquote individuals, they work for themselves even more so than they already do. Mm -hmm. So it's not a sign of respect to you or trying to relate to you. They think they're better than you. Well, it's also a sleight of hand, right? Because if they are identifiably elites through dressing well or what have you, then there are responsibilities exactly. that come with that and accountability yes. that's supposed to come with that. But golly gee, I'm just running around in my hoodie. Uh-huh. I'm just like you. No, you're not. Yeah, you're not, though. <laughs> you have yeah. a lot more power than almost any other person How in the country. How many people live in Pennsylvania? 30 million? 30 million people depend on you, dude. Yeah. It's not a joke. You know, it's not supposed to be. It's mm-hmm. not fun and games here. We're mm-hmm. not talking about the dress code. I think about this for all the politicians. Mm-hmm. I've seen a lot of them. Some of these people, good Lord. Uh, if you see these people out in the wild, it's not pretty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, okay. uh, Whenever you talk about this on on breaking points, you're usually uh, having to sort of defend yourself in your interest for Mm -hmm. this. Um, Nerd out. Like, what's the stuff that that you really care about in suits, in ties, in dress, uh, in menswear um, that to you, like, makes it enjoyable? Because it's become a hobby for you. It's not just a way of dressing. Here's the other thing, right, is that I... Listen, I like suits. Don't get me wrong, but I don't wear them all. Well, actually, when in my off life, I don't really wear suits. Um, I think I, last time I saw you, you were in a hoodie. <laughs> uh, maybe, yeah. yeah. I, I, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, I probably wouldn't wear a hoodie anymore now at this point, but that gets to the point yeah. of I don't always wear a suit. I wear it when I'm here. I wear it whenever I do appearances, and I specifically wear it when I do my show because I believe that I have a great responsibility to people to present myself in the best possible light in order to help them get the news that they deserve in the time that they need and also to be able to share it with anyone that they want in order to make sure that I present the best picture. So that is why I wear the suit, I wear the tie, I care about how I look, I care about my hair. There's no nobility in looking bad. You're doing a great service to others whenever you put care into your appearance. Now, I have also come to like it, but it's not. I didn't always mm-hmm. go that way. I wasn't really into you know i had way more important things to worry about whenever i was a white house correspondent or whatever but at that time i still insisted always have to wear a suit i never set foot in the oval office with sneakers or with any other uh uh with with any other footwear i always had a suit i think at one point even at a tie bar uh whenever i was walking in there and it's because i have immense respect for the institution 
for the room. It's, it wasn't about Trump. To me, it's about history. It's about respect for everybody mm. who's ever been inside. And if you don't have that respect, that, by the way, you should be ashamed of yourself. Um, but realistically, you know, from that point, yes, I have come to uh, enjoy some of it. But I just want to make it clear that I don't do it just because I like it. In fact, yeah. the like came much, much later yeah. than the actual response. I think the first thing that you yeah. had that was like the tell was like the ties. Like you specifically liked those bonobos floral yeah. ties. But you know why I wore those? First... Just because they look good on camera yeah. and because people enjoyed them. It's yeah. not because I liked it. I was yeah. like, yeah, all right. You know, yeah. people get makes people go crazy. All right, I'll wear yeah. the floral ties. Yeah. Uh, I started wearing those. I don't wear them as much. I uh, mostly wear silk ties that I buy on eBay. Uh, just because they they last like old eight, ones, old ones, yeah, yeah, like 40, 50 years old because they last a really long time. It's mm -hmm. great, like I just said, they're like 40, 50 years old. Mm -hmm. Nobody can even tell. Ties hold up great, and a designer tie that pay full price is outrageous. But people on eBay will sell them in tie lots of like 40. So I'm like, great, good to go. Yeah. Now I've got 40 new ties. It's like there's like six Hermes ties in there, you yeah, paid like exactly. three bucks for Bingo. it. Great, awesome. That's <laughs> what I do. Uh, in terms of the knots, I've been playing around recently. I tied a full Windsor for a little while, which I still maintain it's looks better big. on camera. It's too big. <laughs> so I think you're right in person. Yeah. Um, but on the camera, it's all about symmetry. Yeah. It's all about what people are seeing. The point of wearing any men's... This is another thing people need to understand. I dress conservatively whenever it comes to menswear suits and all of that, specifically because if you are watching my show, you should not be distracted. And this actually gets to the whole egalitarian nature yeah. of the suit in the first place. It's like, if you're wearing something crazy, you're kind of failing. The, the floral tie was just enough. It's a touch, but, you know, wearing like a double breasted suit or, uh, I, I don't know, like I'm trying, there's multiple purple window, yeah, pane. purple window pane, <laughs> yeah. something like that. Or even, you know, this, I, I'm wearing a double foreign hand, knot. Right now, this is a tough one to get straight, and it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. uh, but traditionally, I used to tie the uh, old school prep school, not a traditional just foreign hand, and it was always crooked. And people mm -hmm. would always complain because mm -hmm. they're like, and I used to think, I'm like, why do people even mm -hmm. care? And I realized it's because it's drawing them out of the story. So mm -hmm. I tied the full Windsor for a while. I have uh, gotten better at tying a more symmetrical double foreign hand knot, which I do like. Um, but this is about as crazy as I'm going to get, like sitting in front of you. Um, for the show, at least. Yeah. Um, why do you think people get so touchy when there's a cultural moment where people are implying that maybe you shouldn't look like a giant schlub when you walk around outside if you can afford it? Yeah, uh, I think that it reflects a notion of obligation in a comfort in an age of comfort, narcissism and individuality. Fundamentally, dressing nicer or dressing to older norms will require sacrifice of comfort, will require more attention to detail. And that's just not what our culture prioritizes. And so it just cuts against that grain. The technology industry is the worst offender at this. They're like, we don't care what you wear as long as the work product is there. And, you know, maybe in that one specific case, that might be true. But I'm still not actually entirely sure that it is. Well, um, and when all these people come to D.C., they yeah. still put on their suit and tie. <laughs> exactly. That's right. I, yeah, I always think about I'm like, hey, look at Elon. I mean, by the way, Elon does dress terribly, but uh, he still wears a suit. Yeah. He still wears a suit. Yeah. Hey, there's some good pictures of him in white tie. He, he owns um, it. Um, he did. Yes, that's right. But yeah. yeah, but whenever he's been wearing dress sneakers recently, which is horrible. He also wears all black. Why black do you hate suit. dress sneakers so much? Uh, I just think they look bad. I mean, the white sole is just totally incongruent with the rest. I mean, I just said the entire point of the suit and of a great garment, a great outfit is in order to draw draw and accentuate your best features. If you're wearing as like a Mc Kevin McCarthy, whenever he went to the uh, Oval Office, or maybe it was McConnell, I forget. He's wearing all black. Black suit. I mean, bright... it was literally all of them other than yeah, Kamala Harris were right. wearing some form of like informal so shoe in Biden that picture. I think Biden was wearing proper shoes. Okay. I do think he was wearing proper yeah. shoes. I'll give it to him. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's wearing what I'm wearing right now, Alan Edmonds, um, which are just easy drivers. Let me throw a shout out. They have stores in like every major city. Yeah. The main thing is, yes, there are better shoe brands, but it's still better to buy something that actually fits you. So yeah. go get properly fitted and yeah. then you can buy it. And then also maybe you can buy it on eBay, whatever, you know, go for it. Uh, more so, I'm just saying, you know, fit is a is a key part of this too. Mm -hmm. If you do work hard enough, you can get a good pair of dress shoes like what I'm wearing right now, which is not uncomfortable for me at all. Mm -hmm. If you buy a good pair of boots, you can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But that requires care and it cares a little bit of attention, which is again, a lot of people don't want to do that. Yeah. They want to put their time into something else like video games or yeah. marijuana. Yeah. yeah, they want to put on. Yeah. You walk by, there's a weed dispensary um, uh, oh, wow. over here that opened up and every day I, going to hell. I'm, I'm reminded that I have to, um, you know, not commit crimes. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, Sagar, where can people keep up with everything that you're doing, everything that you're talking about? You're way more famous than we are, so people are going to find it anyway. Uh, uh, but 
answer that question. Esager, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Breaking Points, YouTube, rate, subscribe, five stars. Hit me. Actually, I'll throw it out for your podcast. You, you guys should rate. Subscribe to his YouTube channel, rate five stars, share with uh, friends and family, and then write a review. Awesome. There you go. Thank you for coming on the show. You're welcome. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. I certainly enjoyed having Sagar back here. I'll tell you, I, I get a lot of my news from Breaking Points. It is a great way early in the morning to get digestible information on everything that matters. So seriously, go check it out. He doesn't need my help to boost him in the algorithm. But um, for what it's worth, uh, if you're a staffer in DC, I think it's a great way to get some news and get some different perspectives that you might not see when the boomers are ranting on Fox. I think that if you work for a member of Congress that actually has something interesting to say, they should go on Breaking Points. If if you need help with that, call me about it. Um, they're going to ask tough questions. They're going to make it so that you actually have to answer for the things that you believe in, but it's a different audience and it's a much bigger audience than cable news has these days. Um, be sure to rate and review this podcast as Sagar implored you all to do in the closing. Um, five stars only on Apple Podcasts. Subscribe on YouTube. We've had this explosion in YouTube subscribers recently because the David Goldman episode went bananas. Um, so go follow us on there um, and share this podcast with your friends um, because it's through word of mouth that we get all of our esteemed listeners. I'll see you guys next week. Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.